Hello everybody and welcome to the first of a new series of videos and this one's on statutory interpretation and I'm going to introduce what I mean by statutory interpretation in this video and then we'll go on subsequently to pick up each of the individual areas and the individual rules so it might be quite a long series um, but that because that's because there's a lot for us to squeeze in and some of the things that we have to squeeze in are um, quite complex and difficult to understand and you get a chance to listen to me pronouncing some really dodgy Latin but let's uh, start by talking about what we mean. What is statutory interpretation? And you'll notice that I've got a picture of a judge as my centerpiece here. And that's because I want to start by talking about the separation of powers. You'll recall from the separation of powers, or you recall from our earlier um, work on parliamentary lawmaking, that the separation of powers involves three branches of, um, of, of society and state. One is the legislature. One is the executive, and I'm not going to talk about the executive today. I don't know why I can't spell. I'm not going to talk about the executive today, so I'll leave it over here. And the third is the judiciary. And you'll also recall that all three of these need to be separate. People can't serve in more than one. That's the rule anyway. It doesn't technically happen, but that's the rule. And that's one of the reasons, of course, why the judges had to move out of the House of Lords and move into the Supreme Court. Now, the primary element of the legislature, the main element, is Parliament. And it's Parliament's job to create law. And they do that because they're elected on behalf of us. The, the electorate, the public people. So therefore, it's Parliament who work on behalf of us to create laws, to create the laws that we elect them to create. It's the job of the judiciary to interpret those laws, to decide what Parliament meant. And I'll explain why, and that's what this whole video is about actually, but I'll explain why as we work through the video in a moment. Now, it's interesting to note that 75% of all Supreme Court cases, there or thereabouts, are now dealing with statutory interpretation. But what is it that we're interpreting? What is it that the judges are interpreting about what Parliament created? Well, it's straightforward, really. The problem is words. And you might think, what a load of rubbish. But actually, when you start to look at the complexity of words and the complexity of our language, you can see how easy it is for Parliament to write and mean one thing, but miss the fact that what they've written might mean another. And I'll explain what I mean by that, because often words mean more than one thing. And sometimes the context of the act does not help. Consider this problem. What do we mean by the word stamp? Now, that could mean, of course, a postage stamp. It could mean to put your foot on something. Both would have very different meanings of the same word. Patient means to wait and to be... Um, to wait for something to happen. Or it could mean, of course, somebody that's a resident of a hospital. Season could mean um, spring, autumn, winter, summer, or it could mean to add salt and pepper. Now you may think, well, that's a load of nonsense. It's obvious, it's going to be absolutely obvious what we mean when those words are used because we'll apply the context. The context will tell us whether or not we're talking about winter or whether or not we're talking about salt and pepper. The problem is, frequently, the context doesn't help. Let's have a look at these two images here. Very famous case. I'm going to give you some of it, but it's worth looking. And certainly, if you are members of the Law Bank, um, then there is a whole set of activities based around R versus Bassett. And that's 2008. Now, here the problem with R versus Bassett is it revolves around the Sexual Offences Act. 
and that's the 2003 Act, and it's sections 67 and 68. Okay, and 67 is a is about something called voyeurism. I think I can spell that voyeurism. And 68 is about the interpretation of what we mean by voyeurism. Voyeurism. Now, effectively, voyeurism is is watching somebody else. And section 68a clearly says that what we mean by voyeurism is we means when we look at, when we watch somebody, and we particularly watch their genitals, buttocks, or breasts. And it's the use of the word breasts that causes an issue in R versus Bassett. And in which, in this case, the question that I ask you is, when we use the word breasts, do we mean male or female? Because the case of Bassett involves a man called Kevin Bassett, who drilled a hole in the changing room at a swimming pool and filmed men undressing. It was at a height to see their chests. He was convicted at the first instance and appealed. And the appeal was based on what do we mean by breasts? So let me run through very clearly the circumstances of the case and the ruling. So the appellant, Kevin Bassett, took a small video camera hidden in a bag with a hole in it into the men's changing room at a public swimming pool. He was spotted watching and plainly either filming or intending to film a man who was taking a shower. The appellant was interested in filming the man. The man had his swimming trunks on and this case raises two issues. The first is whether the man was in a place and circumstances which would reasonably expected to provide privacy. And secondly, whether, since he was bare-chested, it was a case in which his breasts were exposed within the meaning of the statutory definition under Section 68 of the Sexual Offences Act 2003. The court held that the original judge's direction as to the meaning of breasts in section 68.1a, just make that clear, was wrong. Breasts was a term which in this instance was meant to apply to women and not men. The conviction therefore couldn't stand and had to be quashed, the appeal was allowed and Bassett went free. So the Act clearly says that you cannot, if somebody's in a private place, you cannot watch their breasts. The problem is, what do we mean by the word? So you can see, it might be easy to say, stamp's obvious, patient's obvious, season is obvious, but when we start to use something in the context in which, it, or in a diff, slightly different context, it becomes more problematic. Let's have a think about these two items. Some of you will be familiar, some of you will not. This, of course, if you're not familiar, and heaven only knows why you wouldn't be familiar with that, is what's known as a Jaffa cake. Bit of sponge on the bottom, jam and chocolate. Okay, so that's sponge. There's a layer of jam and then chocolate. This is known as a marshmallow tea cake. There you've got some biscuit-ish stroke sponge. Here you've got some marshmallow. And here on top you've got some chocolate. Now, you might think, what on earth is Powell going on about now? Well, under current taxation law, you do not pay VAT on cakes, snacks or normal biscuits. But you do pay VAT on chocolate-covered biscuits and potato snacks. 
So, if you were the manufacturers of Jaffa cakes and marshmallow tea cakes, what would you prefer them to be? You would, of course, prefer them to be cakes because you do not pay VAT on cakes. Hence, very cleverly, they've been called the Jaffa cake and they've been called the marshmallow tea cake. I'm not going to tell you the results of those. What I want you to do is to consider, is the Jaffa cake a cake or a chocolate covered biscuit? Is the marshmallow tea cake a chocolate covered biscuit or is it a cake or normal biscuit? Are these normal biscuits or are they chocolate covered biscuits? Now again, let's look at something very famous that you'll all know and that's the Pringle. The key thing to ask is, is the Pringle a crisp? Under current taxation law, you do not pay VAT on most snack foods, but you do on a potato snack. And a potato snack, so a potato snack, is defined as potato crisps, potato sticks, potato on the puffs, those cheesy puffs, and similar products. Okay? And those similar products have to be made from the potato, from potato flour, or from potato starch. Now, let me think about this, because the Pringle, believe it or not, is only 43% potato. It also comes in a very odd package. It is also shaped very differently. If you take a normal pair of Walkers or Smiths or anybody other flavour crisp, you'll see that the Pringle is very, very different. And this actually results in a large case called HMRC, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, versus Proctor and Gamble. And a series of cases culminating in 2009. Once again, I am not going to tell you the result of that. There is an extensive set of activities uh, at the Law Bank in which you can um, download and to use, or similarly, you can just go and follow the HMRC versus Procter & Gamble series of cases to find out what the courts determined Pringles were, whether they were crisps and therefore no VAT, or whether they were not crisps and Procter & Gamble had to charge VAT on them. So, the context of the act is vital. And I hope in those things that you've been very clearly to see how difficult sometimes words can be. So finally, let's have a look at these just to labour the point and to rub this in. The first to think about is, can a paper boy sue for unfair dismissal after the time of his paper round was changed and he refused to carry out his round at the new time? because he refused he was sacked. The question is, is a paper boy an employee? The second is, can a wave runner, one of those big huge things that you see in the water, be a ship for the purposes of the Merchant Shipping Act 1995? So therefore, if it crashes into another, causing them serious injury, can the driver be prosecuted? Does a place without a roof make a building? Cremations, i.e. where a dead body is burnt, cremations must take place in a building. Can that include a roof, a place without a roof, or a place with no walls but a roof? And finally, prams. Can a pram be a carriage or a vehicle under the Licensing Act 1872? And therefore, if, they, if that is the case, can it be an offence to be drunk in charge of one? 
So you can see how important getting these words right is. Well, let's have a look. Paperboy, in a case in Kent in 2010, it was deemed that a paperboy was not an employee. So he's not an employee. And that's partly because there's no contract of employment. But it required the court to make a decision on what an employee was. The wave runner is very complex. There are a number of cases. You have Steedman versus Schofield. Uh, and that was, I think, that was 1992. And then you have R versus Goodwin. And that's 2005. And essentially, at the moment, the courts have said that it is not a vessel that is used for navigation, which is the definition of a ship. But because there is a problem this is having to go back to Parliament for Parliament to make a decision on whether to include, through a statutory instrument, a wave runner as a ship. But at the moment, I think the position is still that it is not. But it's hugely complex. In the roof without a building, we're looking at R versus Newcastle County Council. And that's on behalf, of the, the Crown is working on behalf of somebody called Guy. And it's about a Hindu, that's the problem here. It's about a Hindu who after death wants to be create, cremated, burnt, in a funeral pyre. That is, wants to be placed on top of a fire and lit in accordance with and burnt in accordance with his religion. The council refused to allow that because it said that cremations have to take place in a building. And a funeral pyre, of course, means that you shouldn't have a roof on top of your building, otherwise the building will catch fire. In this instance, so sorry, so that's a no. In this instance, the court says that they were allowed to do it. They were allowed and that a building could be a building even though it didn't have a roof for this purpose. And finally, the pram. Well, the answer to that is sort of yes, but it's only a half yes, and I'll explain why. At Lenefli in Wales, Lenefli Magistrates Court, in 2013, it was somebody was found guilty of being drunk in charge of a pram. Now, actually, the subtle nuance of this is that they were charged and found guilty of being drunk in charge of a child that they were pushing in a pram. So I'm not quite so sure that it is as straightforward and as obvious. But nevertheless, drunk with a child in a pram will find you guilty. So a pram can be a carriage. So I'm hoping that you can start to see how difficult and complex some of the words in the Acts are. Now, if we go back up here, when Parliament creates these laws, they do not mean for those words to cause that level of confusion. The problem is you just can't think of every single circumstance in which you these instances might be thrown up. It's therefore the job of the judiciary to decide what did parliament mean did parliament mean breasts to be male and female or did it just mean it to be women did parliament mean to include non-potato snacks in crisps did parliament mean when they talked about an employee to include a paper boy on a one day a week paper round that's the job of judges, and that's what statutory interpretation is about. Now, very quickly to finish. The question is, how do judges go about making those decisions about what the words mean? And there are a number of different tools that they have. There are three relatively easy ones, and one that becomes slightly more complex. They might use some of the materials that are within the act itself. They might use some materials that are outside of the act. 
So I'll give you an example, but we'll look at these in greater depth later. A material inside the act might simply be the title. What does the title of the act say that it's meaning to do? Material outside the act might be something as straightforward as a dictionary. What does a dictionary say an employee is? Presumptions are legal presumptions, and we'll discuss those when we do the next video. And finally, there are four legal rules. And the legal rules are these, the rules of interpretation. The judges use all four rules to work out what a statute means. There's the literal rule, the golden rule, the mischief rule, and the purposive approach. And we will look at each of those in turn in subsequent videos. But the key golden rule here, sorry, I shouldn't use golden because that's there, sorry. The key rule for this is that you always start with the literal rule, except for EU law. And EU law, as you'll find, goes straight and can only use the purposive approach. So you always start with the literal rule and then work down. And I'll explain that process in subsequent videos.